Hi, in the last class we talked about identity of particles in quantum mechanics and also the indistinguishability principle. In this session we shall discuss symmetry of wave functions. We now want to see how the principle of indistinguishability influences the quantum mechanics of a system of identical particles. For this we shall start with the simple case of a two particle system. First let us fix the notations that we are going to use. If we are considering a two particle system, we will need to talk about the wave function of the two particle system or some operator, say the Hamiltonian associated with the two particle system. Since there are two particles, we shall label them as 1 and 2. Right? This is part one particle we shall label as particle number 1 and the other as particle number 2. And these numbers will be put inside a parenthesis along with this wave function or the operator. Okay, so we'll have expressions like psi of 1 comma 2, h of 1 comma 2, h of 2 comma 1, etc. Now the position of these uh, numbers, okay, position of these labels inside this parenthesis is also important. Okay. Now psi of 1 comma 2, right here the label 1 appears in the first position inside the parenthesis and label 2 appears in the second position inside the parenthesis. Okay. Now we shall use this notation for the wave function of a two particle system with particle 1 in state alpha and particle 2 in state beta. Okay. We may have something like psi of 2 comma 1. This would represent a state with particle 2 in state alpha and particle 1 in state beta. Okay. So the numbers inside the parenthesis label the particles whereas the position inside the parenthesis denotes the quantum mechanical states of the particles. For example, again, if we are talking about the Hamiltonian, h of 1 comma 2 stands for the Hamiltonian of the system with particle 1 in the state alpha and particle number 2 in the state beta. All right? And h of 2 comma 1 represents the Hamiltonian when particle number 2 is in the state alpha and particle 1 in the state beta. Okay? So this is the notation that we are going to use from here onwards. In the last class, we talked about the principle of indistinguishability of identical particles. Now, if two particles are truly identical, truly indistinguishable, then the physical observables of the system have to be invariant under the interchange of two particles. So, in, if interchanging two particles changes the physical observables of the system, that would mean that the particles are distinguishable somehow. So, the principle of indistinguishability requires that the physical observables of the system and in particular the Hamiltonian be invariant under the interchange of two particles. That is, we must have h of 1 comma 2 is equal to h of 2 comma 1. So, this is the Hamiltonian of, of the system when the first particle is in the state alpha and the second particle in the state beta. This is the Hamiltonian of the system when the second particle is in the state alpha and the first particle is in the state beta. And if the particles are truly indistinguishable, these two Hamiltonians have to be the same. Okay. Let's now take a look at the Schrodinger equation of the system. This is a two particle system. The wave function is written as psi of 1 comma 2. Okay. So let's write this as i h bar partial derivative of psi with respect to t is equal to h of 1 comma 2 acting on psi of 1 comma 2. This is the Schrodinger equation obeyed by the wave function of the two particle system where particle number 1 is in the state alpha and particle number 2 is in the state beta. Now if we interchange the two particles, the corresponding Schrodinger equation would become i h bar partial derivative of psi of 2 comma 1 with respect to time. This is equal to h of 2 comma 1 h of 2 comma 1 acting on psi of 2 comma 1. Okay, but we said that if the particles are indistinguishable, we must have h of 2 comma 1 equal to h of 1 comma 2. So we can write the Schrodinger equation as i h bar partial derivative of psi of 2 comma 1 with respect to time is equal to h of 1 comma 2 acting on psi of 2 comma 1. What we see is that psi of 1 comma 2 and psi of 2 comma 1 obey the same Schrodinger equation. So we can say that if psi of 1 comma 2 is a possible state of the two particle system, let's say with a state with a certain energy, then psi of 2 comma 1 is also a possible state 
with the same energy. So basically, it's the Schrodinger equation that tells us what is a possible state. Okay, so here the Schrodinger equation tells us that if the particles are indistinguishable, then psi of 1, comma 2 and psi of 2, comma 1 are possible physical states of the quantum mechanical system. Now, from the viewpoint of classical mechanics, this result has no serious consequence. Okay? But in quantum mechanics, we have something called the superposition, the principle of superposition, and the principle of superposition makes this result of profound significance. Because the principle of superposition says that if psi of 1, 2 and psi of 2, 1 are solutions to the same Schrodinger equation, then any linear superposition of these solutions is also a possible solution to the Schrodinger equation. Okay? In other words, if these two are possible states of the system, then any linear combination of these is also a possible state of the quantum mechanical system. As we said, if psi of 1, comma 2 and psi of 2, comma 1 are possible solutions of the Schrodinger equation, let's say corresponding to a particular energy, then any linear superposition of psi of 1, comma 2 and psi of 2, comma 1 is also a possible solution belonging to the same energy eigenvalue. In particular, the following linear combinations are also possible physical states of the system. Here we have constructed two linear superposition. First one we have written as psi s of 1, 2. And this linear superposition is written as 1 divided by square root of 2 multiplied by 1 plus delta alpha beta. Okay, multiplying psi of 1, 2 plus psi of 2, 1. Right? So we have just added these two wave functions or these two possible solutions and we have a normalization constant here. Now the delta alpha beta here is equal to 1 if alpha is equal to beta, it is 0 if alpha is not equal to beta. So if particle 1 and 2 are not in the same state, then delta alpha beta would be 0 and we would have 1 by square root of 2 psi of 1, 2 plus psi of 2, 1. All right. Whereas if alpha is equal to beta, that means if particle 1 and particle 2 are in the same state, then psi of 1, 2 is the same as psi of 2, 1 and this can be written as twice psi of 1, 2. The normalization factor here would become, since delta alpha beta is equal to 1 with alpha equal to beta, this normalization factor becomes 1 by square root of 4 which is 1 by 2. Okay, and the 2 cancels, so the wave function can simply be written as psi of 1, 2 or psi of 2, 1 because both these are the same. This is the case where alpha is equal to beta. Okay? There's another linear superposition of interest. This we call psi a of 1, 2. This linear superposition is written as 1 divided by root 2 psi of 1, 2 minus psi of 2, 1. Here, if both the particles are in the same state, okay, if alpha is equal to beta, then the wave function is just 0. This combination is just equal to 0. Which means that if this is the wave function, if psi a of 1, 2 is the wave function of the two particle systems, then there is no physical state corresponding to both particles being in the same state. Okay? If both particles are in the state alpha, right, then these two are equal and then this would become equal to 0. Right? Anyway, these two linear superpositions which we call psi s of 1, 2 and psi a of 1, 2 are possible states of the quantum mechanical system because these are also solutions to the Schrodinger equation for the system. Okay? These two linear combinations that we just constructed, they are different from psi of 1, 2 and psi of 2, 1 in an important way. The difference is that psi s of 1, 2 and psi a of 1, 1, 2 have definite symmetry properties under the interchange of the particles. Okay? For example, if we interchange particle 1 and 2 in here, right, so this wave function would become, or this linear combination would become 1 by square root of 2, 2 multiplied by 1 plus delta alpha beta, right, this would become psi of 2, 1 plus psi of 1, 2, right, but this is exactly the same as psi s of 1, 2, right, so this is the same as psi s of 1, 2. Alright? So it's the same as the wave function that we started with. We call this as the symmetric state. 
okay, of this, we say that this wave function is symmetric. That's why we have a subscript S in here. Whereas if you look at psi A of 1, 2, okay, we see that if we interchange these particles, particles 1 and 2, then this wave function would become 1 divided by square root of 2, psi of 2, 1 minus psi of 1, 2. Okay, if we pull this minus outside, this becomes minus 1 by square root of 2, psi of 1, 2 minus psi of 2, 1, which is minus psi A of 1, 2. Okay, it's negative of the wave function that we started with. So, if we interchange the two particles which are in this state, then the wave function picks up an extra minus sign. We, call, we say that this wave function is anti-symmetric. All right. Now, the importance of psi s of psi a, the linear combinations that we just constructed, right? the importance of this arises from the fact that these are the only wave functions that are consistent with the principle of indistinguishability of identical particles. Because in this form, psi s and psi a are non-committal as to which particle is in which state. Okay? So, if we take, for example, psi of 1 comma 2 this wave function is really not this wave function really does not stand well with the principle of indistinguishability because we are labeling the particles as 1 and 2 here and we are saying that the particle 1 is in the state alpha and particle 2 is in the state beta all right but in this wave function there is no fact of the matter as to which particle is in which state so these wave functions are not committed to a fixed state for particle 1 or a fixed state for particle 2. It is actually in a superposition. These wave functions are in a superposition of particle 1 being in state alpha and particle 2 being in state beta and of wave function corresponding to particle 2 in state alpha and particle 1 in state beta. It is the same here. So, these two wave functions are non-committed as to which particle is in which state. In other words, these wave functions or these superpositions do not contain information regarding which particle is in which state. Okay. Let's now examine these states psi s and psi a using the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics. For this, let's introduce a new operator. We shall call this as P12, and this represents the unitary operator that exchanges particles 1 and 2. And the effect of this operator on the wave function is like this p12 acting on psi 1 comma 2 is equal to psi 2 comma 1 okay so essentially what this operator does is to exchange these labels to interchange these labels in this parenthesis okay now it can be explicitly shown that this operator is actually unitary but let's not get into that anyway the only non-unitary operator of interest for us is the time reversal operator all other operators that we are considering in this chapter are unitary operators now if you if you exchange twice right if you make the exchange twice it should get us back to the initial state right because you first exchange one and two and then you exchange two and one we should get back to the initial state that means we must have p12 square is equal to the identity operator so applying this operator twice to a wave function like this is equivalent to applying the identity operator to it because it gets us back to the initial state all right so this means that p12 p12 is equal to the identity operator now if you look at the unitarity condition the unitarity condition says that p12 p12 dagger is equal to p12 dagger p12 which is equal to the identity operator this is just the unitarity condition now the inverse of the operator is actually unique right so here we have p12 is its own inverse because p12 multiplied by p12 gets gets us to the identity operator here we have p12 dagger equal to p12 inverse right so since the inverse is unique we can say that p12 dagger is actually p12 right we can also show it explicitly we can say that p12 dagger equal to p12 or in other words P12, the particle exchange operator that we introduced, is also Hermitian. So we now again have a, a, an operator that is both unitary and Hermitian. If you are not convinced by that, you could do this. The unitarity condition says P12 
P12 dagger is equal to the identity operator and earlier we had P12 square is equal to the identity operator. So let's multiply this from the left by P12. That would, that would give us P12 square P12 dagger equal to P12, right? But P12 square is the identity operator. So we have P12 dagger equal to P12. In other words, as we said before, P12 is a Hermitian operator. So P12 is both Hermitian and unitary. And we have seen one more operator like this, which was both Hermitian and unitary. That was the parity operator. Now again, as we did in the case of the parity operator, since the square of the operator is the identity operator, the eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. This can be easily shown. Okay, let's say that P12 ket alpha. Let's say ket alpha is equal to alpha, which is the eigenvalue, ket alpha. Let's say that this is the eigenvalue equation for this operator P12. Okay. Now let's find P12 square acting on ket alpha. This is equal to alpha P12 acting on ket alpha. We have just introduced one more P12 from the left. But P12 square is the identity operator. So we have ket alpha is equal to and P12 ket alpha using this eigenvalue equation is alpha ket alpha. So ket alpha is equal to alpha square ket alpha or alpha square is equal to 1 which means that alpha can take values plus 1 or minus 1. Okay. So since the square of the operator is the identity operator, the eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. Now the principle of indistinguishability as we said before means that the Hamiltonian is invariant under this transformation. So if the Hamiltonian is invariant, it means that the Hamiltonian operator has to commute with the particle exchange operator. Okay, so the commutator of P12 with H has to be equal to 0. So indistinguishability implies that the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian are also eigenfunctions of the particle exchange operator. In other words, only those eigenvectors of H are allowed which are also eigenvectors of the exchange operator. Okay. So we are making use of the fact that if two operators commute, then they have common eigenvectors. Their eigenvectors are common. So when we say that the particle exchange operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, that means that the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian are also eigenvectors of the particle exchange operator. And the eigenvalues of the particle exchange operator are plus 1 and minus 1. Okay, let's denote the eigenvectors by psi plus of 1 comma 2 and psi minus of 1 comma 2. Psi plus is the eigenvector of P12 with eigenvalue plus 1 and psi minus is the eigenvector of P12 or eigenvector of P12 with eigenvalue minus 1. So let's write down the eigenvalue equation. P12 acting on psi plus of 1 comma 2 is equal to plus 1 multiplied by psi plus of 1 comma 2. But P12 acting on psi plus of 1 comma 2 is also psi plus of 2 comma 1 because this is the definition of the particle exchange operator. So now we have the result psi plus of 2 comma 1 is equal to plus psi plus of 1 comma 2. All right, which means that exchanging these particles has no effect on the wave function. All right, this is what we called the symmetric wave function. So exchanging two particles gives us back the wave function that we started with. All right. The second example is P12 acting on psi minus is equal to minus psi minus of 1 comma 2. But the effect of P12 is to exchange these labels or exchange these two particles. So P12 acting on psi minus is equal to psi minus of 2 comma 1. Okay, P12 acting on psi minus of 1 comma 2 is psi minus of 2 comma 1. So, this eigenvector has the property that psi minus of 2 comma 1 is equal to minus psi minus of 1 comma 2. Right? And what was this? This was the anti-symmetric wave function that we constructed. So, the symmetric and anti-symmetric wave functions that we constructed are actually eigenvectors of the particle exchange operator. Alright? So, the wave functions psi s and psi a are clearly eigenvectors of the parity operator. Okay? We can write this in another way. We can write psi plus is equal to psi s of 1, 2 
and what was psi s of 1 comma 2 is 1 divided by 2 multiplied by 1 plus delta alpha beta multiplying 1 plus p12 or the identity operator plus the particle exchange operator acting on psi 1 2 okay you multiply this you see that this gives us the correct wave function that we wrote down earlier because the identity so this gives us the identity operator acting on psi 1 comma 2 is just psi 1 comma 2 okay there's a plus sign in here and the particle exchange operator acting on psi 1 comma 2 gives psi of 2 comma 1 all right and this was the this was the wave function that we constructed and called as psi s of 1 comma 2 Okay, so psi s of 1 comma 2 apart from the normalization factor here can also be written as the identity operator plus the particle exchange operator acting on psi of 1 comma 2 all right similarly the anti-symmetric wave function that we constructed earlier can be written as 1 minus p12 acting on psi 1 comma 2 right and then there's this normalization factor 1 divided by square root of 2 all right so we may say that the physical state of a system of two identical particles is represented either by psi s or psi a. The wave functions that we use to represent a system of two identical particles has to be either symmetric or anti-symmetric. These have to be eigenvectors of the particle exchange operator. All right. Now, moreover, the fact that P12 commutes with the Hamiltonian implies that this symmetry property is a constant of motion. Okay. So that means that the eigenvalue of the particle exchange operator cannot change with time. If it's a symmetric wave function, if we start with a symmetric wave function, it will remain a symmetric wave function corresponding to the eigenvalue 1 of the particle exchange operator. And if you start with uh, an anti-symmetric wave function, then it will remain an anti-symmetric wave function even as the system evolves with time. Right, which is the eigenvector of the parity, sorry, of the particle exchange operator with eigenvalue minus one. These eigenvalues are not going to change. Okay. These are not going to change under time evolution because P12 is a constant of motion. Since it commutes with the Hamiltonian, it has to commute with the Hamiltonian uh, for the principle of indistinguishability to hold. Okay. So far, we discussed the case of two identical particles and we concluded that the wave function for two identical particles must either be symmetric or anti-symmetric because these are the only wave functions consistent with the principle of indistinguishability of identical particles. In other words, the wave function for two identical particles must be an eigenvector of the particle exchange operator. Okay, and the eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. If the eigenvalue is plus 1, we say that the wave function is symmetric. And if the eigenvalue is minus 1, the wave function is anti-symmetric. Now, these considerations can be easily extended to the case of a system of n identical particles. Of course, we could think of a system with n identical particles. And one question that we can ask is, how many two-particle exchange operators are there? It's the same as asking, in how many ways can we pair the particles? And this is a simple combinatorial problem because we are asking, in how many ways can we choose two particles from a collection of n particles? And the answer is n multiplied by n minus 1 divided by 2. Okay? These are the number of ways in which you can choose two particles from a system of n particles. So these are the number of ways we can pair particles. So these are also the number of two particle exchange operators, which we denote as p hat ij. Now for indistinguishability, each of these two particle exchange operators must commute with the Hamiltonian. Any interchange of two particles must not change the Hamiltonian, which means that all of these uh, two particle exchange operators must commute with the Hamiltonian. That is, we must have Pij hat, the commutator of Pij hat with the Hamiltonian is equal to zero, the operator zero. And Pij is the two particle exchange operator. And this equation is true for all two particle exchange operators. That is, we can take i going from 1, 2 up to n minus 1 and j from 2, 3 up to n. With this, with these choices, we get all the two particle 
exchange operators okay at this point we are faced with a slight difficulty because the exchange operators do not commute among themselves and this can be easily seen okay for example let's look at p1 to p23 acting on three labels a b and c the action of p23 would be to exchange b and c so first apply p23 to this we would get a c b because p23 this is the second position this is the third position and p23 exchanges the labels at the second po position and at the third position okay so the action of p23 on a comma b comma c gives a comma c comma b now you apply p12 to this and then that would exchange whatever is at the first position and whatever is at the second position so we would get c a b so p12 p23 in this order acting on a comma b comma c three labels gives us c comma a comma b in this order okay whereas if you apply p23 p12 that is we are applying this in the uh, in the other order we first apply p12 and then apply p23 here we first applied p23 and then p12 so if we do it in the opposite order p12 acting on a comma b comma c gives b a c because this exchanges 1 and 2 so it gives us p23 of b comma a comma c which is which is again you have to exchange whatever is at the second position and the third position and it gives b c a so we see that p12 p23 acting on a b c gives us c a b whereas p23 p12 acting on a comma b comma c gives us b comma c comma a all right these labels could appear in the parenthesis of a wave function etc all right we are just looking at the action of the exchange operator here so we conclude that p12 hat p23 hat is not equal to p23 hat p12 hat in other words the, the exchange operators do not commute among themselves in general we can write p hat ij p hat jk is not equal to p hat jk p hat ij and as a result it is not possible to find a complete set of functions that are simultaneous eigenvectors of all the exchange operators and also of the hamiltonian in the case with n equal to 2 in the case of two identical particles we did not have this difficulty because there was only one exchange operator over there so we can't find a complete set of simultaneous eigenvectors of all the exchange operators and also the hamiltonian okay but we talked about the principle of indistinguishability the principle of indistinguishability of identical particle requires the existence existence of at least one wave function that is a simultaneous eigenvector of all the exchange operators and the hamiltonian because there must be at least one wave function that is non-committal as to which particle is in which state now let phi denote such a function which is a simultaneous eigenvector of all the exchange operators and also the hamiltonian okay we can write the energy eigenvalue equation as h hat acting on phi is equal to e phi and the eigenvalue equation for the exchange operator for the two particle exchange operator can be written as p i j acting on phi is equal to lambda i j multiplying phi okay where well, this this equation sorry there are n into n minus 1 divided by 2 such equations and we already know about the eigenvalues of the exchange operator the eigenvalues can take uh, either plus 1 or minus 1 now we can make use of the fact that pij pik is equal to pjk pij which is in turn equal to pik pjk if i j and k are three different values this may not be immediately obvious so let's just look at a simple example to, to convince ourselves that this is indeed true. Let's consider the case where i is equal to 1, j is 2, and k is equal to 3. So the relation that we wrote down would read in this case as p12, p13 is equal to p23, p12, which is in turn equal to p13, p23. Okay. There are hats here, these are operators, all right? Now this equality can easily be checked uh, in this manner. 
P1 to P13 acting on ABC is equal to. So P13 would exchange A and C. All right. So you get this is equal to P12 acting on CBA. And this exchanges 1 and 2. And the final result is the final result is the sequence BCA. Similarly, P23, P12 also gives BCA. P13, P23 acting on ABC also gives BCA, as you can easily check. All right. So we now have the result PIJ, PIK is equal to PJK, PIJ, which is equal to PIK, PJK. Let's look at the relation uh, between the corresponding eigenvalues. Okay. So the eigenvalue of PIJ is lambda IJ. That of PIK is lambda IK. Okay, so this has to be equal to lambda jk lambda ij, which is in turn equal to lambda ik lambda jk. Okay, we get this relation simply by applying these things to the to the common eigenfunction that we denoted as phi. All right, just introduce a phi on the right hand side, and then you see that you get this relation. Now let's look at this part. Lambda ij lambda ik is equal to lambda jk lambda ij. These are numbers. So the lambda ij here cancels with the lambda ij here and we get the result that lambda ik is equal to lambda jk. All right. Similarly, you can look at this equation. Again, these are numbers. We see that lambda jk lambda ij is equal to lambda ik lambda jk. There is again a lambda jk here and here. And we get the relation lambda ij is equal to lambda ik. Okay, so now we have lambda ik equal to lambda jk and lambda ij is equal to lambda ik. Or together we can write lambda ij and lambda ik and lambda jk are the same. They are equal. That is, the common eigenvector phi belongs to the same eigenvalue of all the exchange operators. If lambda ij is equal to 1, or if these eigenvalues are equal to 1, then we say that phi is totally symmetric, which means that it is symmetric under the interchange of any pair of particles. We shall denote this state as phi s, the symmetric state. And the, this eigenvalue, the eigenvalue of the particle exchange operator could also be minus 1. And if this eigenvalue is minus 1 for this state, then we say that this state is totally antisymmetric. Because any exchange will introduce an extra minus sign to this wave function. This antisymmetric wave function will be denoted as phi a. Okay. So we can write pij phi s equal to plus 1 multiplying phi s. Whereas pij phi a is equal to minus phi a. So we have come to an important result. Okay. The result is that the wave function of a system of identical particles is either totally symmetric or totally antisymmetric. This is a direct consequence of the indistinguishability of identical particles. So you may keep in mind that the wave function of a system of identical particles, whether it's a two particle system or an n particle system, if these are identical particles, then the wave function of the composite system is either totally symmetric or totally antisymmetric. Let me conclude the session with that result. Thank you.